Hello, and welcome to part two of the IAM Policy Evaluation video series. My name is Matt Luttrell, and today we're going to talk about conditions. We'll start with the review of the condition element from part one of this series. We'll do a deep dive of different condition operators. We'll then go through the difference between multi-valued and single-valued condition keys. And then we'll take a look at patterns used to make requests and how that impacts what condition keys you should use in your policies. Let's start with our review of the condition element. As we saw in part one of this series, the condition element is an optional element that lets you specify when a policy is in effect. This policy statement allows an S3 get object or S3 put object request to the example bucket resource, but only if the request is made using TLS. Let's also review what the authorization context is. When you make a request to AWS, we build information about that request and put that information in a big property bag. This includes information about who is making the request, the target of the request, and even some values that you supply, like tag keys and values. IAM then compares this authorization context to your IAM policies to determine which policy statements match, and in the end, if a request is allowed or denied. The authorization context shown here is just an example and not a complete replica of what the full authorization context will look like for a request. The important piece here, as it relates to conditions, are the context keys and values that are present in the authorization context. You write conditions in your policies to match against these context values. I also want to quickly review definitions of the different elements that make up a condition. The operator defines the comparison that IAM should perform against the authorization context. The key defines which value in the authorization context IAM should look at for that comparison. And the values are what must match the value in the authorization context for a statement to match. There are a number of different condition operators, and we will be going deeper into some of them in this video. You can also use different suffixes on an operator, such as equals and like, to do exact matching and wildcard matching respectively. You can also add things like not to many of these operators to invert them. On the right side, you can see what are called multi-valued qualifiers. For now, just know that these exist. We will go into much more depth later in this video on the use of these qualifiers. Now, some condition keys are not present in every request, which also means that they are not available in every authorization context. So how do you figure out which condition keys can be used with which actions and which resources? That's where the service authorization reference comes in. The service authorization reference is an IAM documentation page that documents a particular services authorization design. The page you see here is the documentation for AWS Lambda's authorization design. You can see that the particular Lambda condition keys are associated with a particular action and resource combination. There's also a section elsewhere on each page of the service authorization reference, which contains a complete list of what we call service specific condition keys and their types. The types here tell you which operator you should use to perform the comparison. A condition key that has a type that starts with array of indicates that the condition key can have multiple values in the authorization context and that you should use a multi-valued qualifier to compare it. So either for all values or for any value. We'll come back to this later. There are also condition keys that work across all AWS services. These condition keys are called global condition keys. Global condition keys and their types are documented on a separate page, which describes each key and when you can expect to see each key in the authorization context. These are two great pages to bookmark for anyone that has to write IAM policies. Now, getting back to our policies, let's do a quick review on how the Boolean logic works for conditions. Before I get started, you're going to see a lot of policy examples in this video. 
don't get too caught up on the specific policies. The focus on this video is to review the concepts and not to provide you with policies that you should copy and paste into your environment. Okay, with that, values for a condition keys are ORed. This means that this policy matches an authorization context for the IAM create role action if the tag in the request with the key of team has a value of team A or team B or team C. If the operator is negated, like you see here with string not equals, the values are NORD. This policy denies the creation of an IAM role if the tag in the request with key team does not have a value of team A, nor team B, nor team C. And this is your way to add a list of exceptions in a deny statement. All condition keys in a request are logically anded together. This is true even if the operators have different names, as shown in this example with string equals and string like. All condition keys must evaluate to true independently for the policy statement to match. Condition keys that contain an effect of deny and negated operators, like string not equals, are still anded together, though they can be a bit trickier to follow. This pattern of multiple negated condition keys and a deny statement is also one that's commonly seen used when implementing an exception list. This statement reads, everything is denied when calling the create bucket action, except for the values listed in these conditions. All right, with that review aside, let's dive deeper into some of our condition operators, starting with the ARN and string operators. Let's start by stating what seems like the obvious. You should use ARN operators for ARN condition values and use string operators for string condition values. But this is for more than just feeling good about making our policies neat and readable. Let's take a look at an actual example that illustrates why this is important. Adding the like suffix to the end of the condition operator tells the authorization engine that it should do a wildcard match and not an exact match. You can use the asterisk, as you see in these examples, for a multi-character wildcard match, or you can use a question mark for a single character wildcard match. You would use the equals suffix if you wanted an exact match. What I'm showing here are two statements with the condition that compares the exact same value for the source ARN condition key. The only difference between these two statements is the condition operator. The top condition uses ARN like and the bottom condition incorrectly uses string like. Now, let's say we had a request with the sample authorization context. The fictitious source ARN in this example is a valid ARN, and we're using an ARN operator to compare it in our policy. Remember from part one in this series, the policy evaluation is just a matching exercise between the policy and the authorization context. So when IAM's authorization engine does this ARN-like comparison, it starts by splitting the ARN into six distinct pieces and then compares each piece individually like so. Everything matches until we get to the account ID portion of the ARN, which does not match. And therefore we can say that this overall compar condition comparison does not match as we would expect. Now, let's take the same example and use the string-like operator. We're using the same sample authorization context and the same source ARN value in our condition. The only difference from the previous example is the string-like operator instead of the ARN-like operator. This time, when IAM's authorization engine does the string-like comparison, it doesn't split the ARN into pieces. Instead, it does a raw string comparison, which ends up looking something like this. The first part looks good and matches our expectations. But then we get to the wild card in the condition. And the wild card is going to end up matching more of the ARN than we expected. And this means that the rest of the ARN also matches. 
So with the same exact condition key, condition value, and authorization context, but using a condition, a different condition operator, we produce two different results for this particular evaluation. Now this won't be the case for every evaluation, but save yourself a possible headache here and make sure you're using ARN operators for ARNs and string operators for strings. One last unrelated note about ARN comparisons before we move on. The behavior of ARN like and ARN equals are actually equivalent, meaning that ARN equals also does wildcard matching. And this works this way mostly for historical reasons. This equivalence also applies to the negated versions of these operators, so ARN not like and ARN not equals are also equivalent. So again, use the ARN operators for ARNs and use the string operators for strings. This will help you avoid the possibility of the behavior you saw in this example. Now moving on to two other types of operators, if exists and null. The null condition operator checks to see if the condition key is absent from the authorization context. The null operator evaluates to true when a key is absent. This can be useful if you want to just check for the absence or existence of a condition key, but you don't care what the actual value of the key is. In the example you see here, we deny the creation and modification of a Lambda function unless the function is attached to any VPC. Here, we don't care what VPC it's attached to, just the fact that it has an attachment is good enough for us. If we look at this sample authorization context, you can see that there's no Lambda VPC IDs context key present, meaning that our null condition operator from the policy which is saw would evaluate to true. The if exists operator works in a similar way, but it also allows us to effectively include another comparison. You can attach the if exists operator as a suffix to the end of any other condition operator except for the null operator. Now this policy looks similar to the one we just saw, and the string equals if exists operator says that this condition will match if either the VPC ID's key is absent from the authorization context or the key is present and equal to the ID specified. Now again, don't get too caught up in the actual details of this policies. We are just worried about the concepts here. If you think about if exists in terms of the null operator, the string equals if exists example that we just saw is shorthand that roughly translates to these two separate statements. On the left, you have deny Lambda function creation or modification for the specified VPC. And on the right, you have deny creation or modification if no VPC is specified. Now, what happens if we use the if exists operator with an effect of allow? The author of this policy wants to say that only principals with a job title tag of developer should be able to run an EC2 instance. But the problem here is that this policy also allows principals without any job title tag at all to run an EC2 instance. Be careful when using if exists and allow statement and make sure that you understand what the behavior of your policy is if a context key is not present in the authorization context. One last note before we move on, if exist has no impact on the evaluation when used with a negated condition operator as seen on the left. These two policies are equivalent and the if exist is unnecessary. Now that said, if you're writing guardrails like service control policies, it can sometimes be useful to just include if exists at the end of your condition operators as a bit of a safety net. Now that's because these policies typically have an effective deny. And when you write guardrails like service control policies, you often want to deny if the context key is not present. Adding if exists by default just saves you from having to reason about this type of behavior for each operator in a deny policy. Okay. On to what might be the most important concept in this video, multi-valued condition keys. Now the examples I'm going to use in this section primarily deal with tags. There's no significance to that other than the tagging condition keys tend to make it easier to explain some of these concepts. 
Pause the video, take a look at this policy, and see if you can figure out what's wrong with it. Okay, hold your thought. I'm going to give you the answer in a bit, but I want to walk you through how this behaves first. Now back to our sample authorization context. And if you take away nothing else from this section, remember that when we say multi-valued keys, it means that the context key is capable of having multiple values in the authorization context. The only multi-valued key in the sample authorization context is AWS tag keys, which has three independent values in this example. Every other context key that you see here is a single valued key and can only ever have a single value in the authorization context. When you have a multi-valued key, you should use a multi-valued qualifier with your condition operator, either for any value or for all values. The statement on the left uses for any value and allows the creation of an IAM role if any one value for tag keys in the auth context appears in this possible list of values. So either team A or team B. There can be other tag keys values in the auth context, but one of them must be team A or team B. The statement on the right uses for all values and allows the creation of an IM role if all values for tag keys in the auth context are found in the list specified in this statement. So for the statement on the right side to match, all of the tag keys values in the auth context must be team A or team B. You don't have to have both, but you can't have a value like team C in the auth context. Importantly, multi-value does not refer to the number of values in your IAM policy. It refers to the number of values in the authorization context. The operator you see here, principal tag, is not a multi-valued key even though this statement is written to have multiple values in the IAM policy. You should not use for any value or for all values for statements like this. So let's test our understanding with a matching example. Feel free to pause the video and try to determine if this statement should allow or deny the request. The way to go about evaluating this statement in your head is to start with the values in the auth context. Go through each value and see if it's allowed by the statement. Remember that every value in the auth context must be allowed by the statement because we're using for all values here. Let's look at the tag keys context key and start with team A. We see that team A is allowed by the statement, so we move on to the next value. Team B is also allowed by the statement. When we get to team C, we see that there's no team C in our statement. So we can say that this statement does not match and access would not be allowed by this statement. Now what happens if there are no tags in the request and tag keys is not present at all in the auth context? The statement here actually matches and would be allowed. This might be surprising to you, and it's definitely something that you should be aware of. A condition operator using the for all values qualifier will evaluate to true if the context key is not present in the auth context. Let's look a little closer at how this evaluation works for a single condition key. We start with true before any comparisons are done. We loop through each value in the auth context, not the policy, if the value is not present in the auth context, there's nothing to loop through and we stop here and return true. If it is present, we look at each value in the auth context and ask the question, does this value match a value in the policy? Here we're looking for a string equals match with this statement on the right. If yes, we continue and look at the next value in the auth context. If there's no match, this evaluation returns false as every value in the auth context must match when we're using for all values. So knowing what we know now, if we go back to that original statement, the problem with this policy is that not only does it allow a principal 
with a team infrastructure tag to run instances, but it also allows principals that have no team tag at all to run instances. And this is due to the behavior of for all values when the context key is not present in the authorization context. Here's what the statement should look like with no for all values for the single valued principal tag condition key. Now, even if you correctly use for all values with a multi-valued condition key, as seen here in this example statement, you probably want to be explicit about whether you expect the key to be present in the auth context or not, especially when used in a statement with an effect of allow, as you see here. The addition of this null check ensures that tag keys must be present in the auth context and eliminates the need to worry about for all values evaluating to true when the key is not present in the auth context. Without the null check you see here, this statement would evaluate to true when there is no tag keys present in the auth context. Moving on to the other qualifier for any value. The for any value qualifier should also only be used with multi-valued keys. This statement shows an incorrect use of the for any value condition key. Let's look at how that statement behaves for a request made by a principal without a team tag. A for any value evaluation starts with false. Similar to what we did with for all values, we loop through each value in the auth context. For each of the values, we apply the operator to the value in the auth context. As soon as we get one match, we can evaluate the condition to true. If the value in the auth context is not a match, we continue on to the next value until we've exhausted all values in the auth context. So if we look at this algorithm, if there are no values in the auth context, we can ignore steps two and three. In this condition, just evaluates to false, and the statement does not match, meaning access is not denied with this example statement. Now, this is contrary to what you probably wanted if you authored this statement. Expected if the team principal tag was not team A, then access would be denied. You probably wanted something like this which correctly denies the request unless the team principal tag has a value of admin. So it's also important to ensure that you only use for any value with multi-valued keys as well. Now is a good time to remind you that the actual policy statements here are for illustrative purposes only, and we are just focused on the concepts. Remember from earlier that you can determine if a condition key is multi-valued or single-valued by looking at the service authorization reference or the global condition keys page. A condition key is multi-valued if it has a type that starts with array of. Every other condition key that you see here is single-valued. Okay, at the risk of repeating myself too many times, do not use multi-valued operators with single-valued keys and make sure you understand what the behavior is when a context key does not exist in the auth context for both of the multi-valued qualifiers. And be extra careful when using for all values with an effective allow. Make sure you add that null check. Let's move on to a brief look at policy variables. Policy variables can be used to substitute values from the auth context into your policy at evaluation time. You can substitute any value from the auth context. The policy shown here only allows role assumption when the account of the resource is equal to the account of the principal. And it does so without having to hard code any account ID in the policy. One thing to call out is that you need to use the 2012 policy version in your policies to use policy variables. So when this policy with policy variables is evaluated, the evaluation engine will pull both the principal account and the resource account values from the auth context and compare them. Now this can be a useful way to write a policy once and scale it across your organization.
You can also use policy variables and resources, and they work in the same way. The value is substituted at evaluation time. So this policy could be used to grant put object access to a specific S3 bucket prefix that's based on a principal's tags. But you can only use policy variables in the resource name, which is the rightmost portion of the ARN. You can't use them elsewhere, as this policy attempts to do. This is not a valid policy. What if the policy variable isn't present in the authorization context? Well, it effectively resolves to a null value in that case. So the statement listed here that tries to compare to a non-existent team tag in the request would not match. Okay, that was a quick look at policy variables. In addition to a requirement to use the 2012 policy version, there are a few other things to keep in mind. Multi-valued condition keys cannot be used in policy variables. And policy variables can only be used with string, bool, and arn condition operators. And as already mentioned, they can also be used with resources, but only in the resource name portion of the resource arn. Okay, so it's one thing to know how condition keys are evaluated and how the different condition operators work, but you also need to understand when it makes sense to use a given condition key in your policies. And in this section, we're going to walk through the different patterns used to make AWS requests and see what condition keys you can use for each type of pattern. Let's get into it. There are two main categories of patterns used to make a request. The first category of patterns includes the different ways AWS services make requests on your behalf or to your resources. We call these service impersonation and delegation patterns. And those are service roles, service linked roles, forward access sessions, and service principles. The second category is what I'm calling direct requests made by you, and more or less contains requests that don't fall in the first category. These are requests that you make using credentials that you have direct access to. An example here could be requests that are made from outside of AWS using the CLI or SDK, or by humans accessing the console, just to name a few. Let's talk more about the significance of these patterns. Requests made directly are the most straightforward. This is simply when you assume a role on your own and make requests to an AWS service. Role assumption here can be either through some type of federation or by calling STS assume role directly. Now you can substitute IAM users for IAM roles for most of this conversation, but I'm going to keep the focus on IAM roles since IAM roles and their short-term credentials are the recommended way to make direct requests. Now requests made with service roles are similar, but the difference with a service role is that an AWS service assumes your role and then makes calls on your behalf. Oftentimes these calls will originate from the account and network that the AWS service lives in and will therefore impact what values are set for networking specific context keys in the authorization context. Requests made by service roles and requests made directly behave similarly. Because the principles that make both types of requests belong to you, both of these request patterns can be controlled by policies on the identity, meaning policies such as identity policies, permissions boundaries, and service control policies, or SCPs. They can also be controlled by policies that are attached to a resource, like resource-based policies. You can expect condition key values in the authorization context for these two request patterns to be the same or similar. The one exception that we talked about is that requests from service roles may come from the account and network that the AWS service lives in, and you'll need to account for that in policies that reference networking condition keys. Service linked roles look and feel similar to service roles. A service assumes a service linked role and makes a call on your behalf. There's one major difference here. And that's the fact that you can't modify a service linked role directly. 
the AWS service associated with that service-linked role owns and manages the creation and modification of the role. The fact that a service-linked role is managed by an AWS service means that you cannot control the policies on the identity, meaning you can't modify the identity-based policy or do something like attach a permissions boundary to a service-linked role. Service-linked roles are also not subject to your service control policies. You can, however, control service-linked roles through policies on your resources using something like a resource-based policy to allow or deny access to service-linked roles. And these roles are always created in a specific reserved role path with a specific prefix on the role's name. Knowing this helps you speak generally about service-linked roles when you write policies that impact them. Here are some, but not all, of the condition keys that can be helpful to use when referencing requests made by the patterns that we've talked about so far in your IAM policies. These keys allow you to authorize requests based on different properties of the principles. These keys are all set in a similar fashion for the three patterns of requests that we've talked about so far. And all of these keys are what we call global condition keys. Now let's talk about Forward Access Sessions, or FAS. FAS is a technology that's used by AWS services to allow a service to make a request to another service on your behalf. The request appears to the downstream service as if it was made by your principal, my role in the image you see here. Let's see how this works. The process starts when your role makes a request to a service. In this case, a create stack request to the CloudFormation service. Notice the via AWS service condition key here, which is set to false for this initial call and all calls that do not use this fast pattern. The CloudFormation service then makes a request on your behalf to another service, in this case to DynamoDB to create a table. This is the request that's made using FAST. It sets the via AWS service condition key value to true and attaches some additional context keys, including the called via context key, which indicates which service this request originated from on your behalf. And finally, DynamoDB makes a request to KMS to create a grant, and it also does so using FAS. You can see that the DynamoDB service gets appended to the value of the called via condition key, which is a multi-valued condition key, showing KMS that this request also passed through DynamoDB. Fast requests can also be controlled by policies on the identity and policies on the resource, and this includes service control policies. Fast requests are also going to have similar condition key values to the other request patterns that we've seen thus far. Since fast requests are actually made by an AWS service, the networking context key values for those requests may belong to networks that AWS services own and not networks that you own. And you'll need to take that into account when building network-based IAM policies. As mentioned, fast requests also add some additional context keys and values that express what path the request took through various AWS services. The important takeaway about FAS in general though, is that the request appears to come from the original principle to each service in the chain, but each service attaches additional data to the auth context as the request traverses the chain. And this allows you to do things like write policies that only allow actions when they are called through a service, but not allow them when they are called directly. If we look at the list of helpful condition keys for FAST requests, you can see that the same principle-centric condition keys here on the left that were useful for the other request patterns that we've talked about remain useful for FAST requests. In addition, we've talked about the via AWS service and called via condition keys that are added when a request is made using FAST. Here you can see there's also condition keys whose values specify the first service in that chain that we saw and the last service in that chain.
Okay, and lastly, let's talk about service principles. A service principle is more or less just a collection of AWS accounts that all belong to a particular service. The concept of a service principle lets you allow or deny access to requests coming from AWS services without having to know their account IDs or role names. It also identifies these requests as coming from a principle belonging to an AWS service. When a service principle makes a request to your resource, similar to what we saw with forward access sessions or FAST, we attach additional metadata to the request. This time, you can see two new additional sets of context keys and values in the request. The first set of context keys identifies that the request is indeed made by a service principal, as well as which service principal actually made the request. We're going to go into more detail about the second set of context keys in a second, but these are the context keys that allow you to implement confused deputy protection on your resources. This set of context keys specify details about the resource that originated the request made by the service principal. For now, just know that these keys are populated when a service principal makes a request. Like service linked roles, service principals can only be controlled by policies on your resources. They're not principles that belong to your organization, so your service control policies and other policies on identities do not apply to them. When you write a policy on a resource that allows access to a service principal, you should include one of the condition keys from the source family of condition keys that you see here. Now let's talk about why you should do that. And to do so, we'll take a look at an example with a bucket policy that allows the CloudTrail service principal to write logs to an S3 bucket. If you're not familiar with a bucket policy, a bucket policy is a form of resource-based policy. The problem with this policy here on the right, however, is that it says nothing about the account or organization where the CloudTrail event originated from. What this means is that if I have a policy like this on my bucket, an account that does not belong to me, like the one you see here, could write CloudTrail events to my S3 bucket. So what should you do? Now this is where you want to use one of the confused deputy keys that I mentioned earlier. Here, we use AWS source org ID to say that this request must originate from a resource within our organization. If you want to be more fine-grained, you can choose to specify the OU path, account, or specific resource ARN as well, using that source family of condition keys. But you should include at least one of these condition keys when you allow a service principal to make a request in a resource-based policy. One final note on source ARN is that this is not the same value as principal ARN. The source ARN context key contains the ARN of the resource that originated a request made by a service principal. The principal ARN condition key contains the ARN of the principal that actually makes the request. These values are not the same. Source ARN is the ARN of a resource. Principal ARN is the ARN of a principal. To summarize, understanding how the request is made can help you figure out what condition keys and values to use in your policies. It also helps you reason about which policies you can use to control which requests. Some request patterns, like service linked roles and service principles, can only be controlled by policies on your resources and not policies on your identities, like service control policies. Okay, another video where we talked about quite a few concepts. We reviewed our condition definitions and how they are populated in the authorization context. We reviewed some different condition operators and interesting behavior of those operators. We talked about the difference between multi-valued and single-valued condition keys, and that multi-valued refers to the number of values in the authorization context and not the number of values in your IAM policy. We said that you can use policy variables to do runtime substitutions in your IAM policies, and we talked about a number of different AWS request patterns to understand that can help you write better IAM policies. Next up, we have part three, where we deep dive on the principal element.
We'll also introduce policy evaluation chains, which will help you understand how the different IAM policies factor into the authorization result. In part four, we'll put everything together and we'll walk through an authorization request start to finish. And with that, thank you, and I hope to see you in the next video.